Um, we are about to go into our uh, final session of the event today. And that final session is looking at how we connect climate services and sector specific decision making. We have a number of speakers that are going to share some, uh, some thinking with you. And then we will host a uh, plenary Q&A towards the end. So our first uh, speaker, who um, you may have just heard, is going to be Claire Goodes from the from UEA. So I'm going to hand over to Claire and um, look forward to your presentation. Which hopefully... Yeah, we can see that. You just need to put it on present. Yeah, yep. there you go. Perfect. Okay, well... Over to you, Claire. Yep, thank you. And welcome everyone to, to, to the third session today, which is, is focusing on, um, I think a topic we've already touched on, connecting climate services and, and decision-making, but particularly in the context of, of specific sectors. So this is a, intended as a very practical session based on sort of real world experiences. So I'm only going to give a, a very brief introduction um, before we'll hear from um, some, some, some case studies that have been undertaken in the context of a number of European um, projects and activities. So we'll hear um, a case study from the energy sector, one of the Seckley firm case studies from, from Gerty. We, we're delighted that we've got colleagues from the Water XR project with us today. So Leah will talk about some experiences in the water sector. And then we'll we'll hear about um, well, the agriculture sector, in particular the viticulture sector from, from Antonio. And finally, we have a group exercise um, which Steve Dawling, my colleague from UEA, will will lead us through. So I think um, it looks like most of you who are, who are online now were also here um, before the break and, and most of you probably heard Alberto's introduction to the Seckley Firm project, um, Horizon 2020 European project. But this is a reminder of the, of the structure of the project. Uh, and you'll see that it kind of brings in many aspects of, of climate services development and implementation and particularly co-design and co-development. So it, it brings in um, the, the, the scientific community in terms of the, de the development, the, the actual science underlying seasonal forecasts, um, their skill, the tailoring for specific decision making. And to facilitate that at the heart of Sackley Firm are these case studies. Um, we heard this morning from a few of these, but I think the, the real success and the important thing to stress about these case studies is that they um, are co-designed with each has an, has, an in, has an industrial partner as well as a research partner. Um, Secretary Firm goes through many of the steps of developing a climate service. We don't quite get to the stage of operational services, but in, um, in one of the work, package, work packages has focused on the development of trial services, such as the, the, the TEAL tool that Marco talked about um, before the break. And we also heard from from Leo and John about some of the other trial services and how those are being used. So I would say that Seckley Firm has considered many of the aspects um, that, that, that underlie um, the, the development and implementation of a business model for climate services, but, but not quite all the steps. So, so this slide is, is drawing on some work done by um, a sort of sister project that ran um, parallel to the Sackley firm. And this, this, this diagram, this, this, this kind of figure 
show some of their thinking about business models for climate services. So you can see that it's quite a going the kind of final steps towards operational climate services is quite a complex process. But I want to draw your attention here to the sort of value proposition, which is the first step in this business model. And it asks the questions about which problem are we addressing, which process are we improving, which decisions are we supporting scientifically. And I think the, the important thing is that this is the kind of first step in developing a climate service um, in a systematic way with an in implementing a business model. So these questions about the decision come sort of before the tailoring of the signs, for example. So we've already heard um, something about how Sackley Firm has focused on the, on the, on the decision-making process in our different case studies. I think this is, if you've been with us since the beginning, this is the third time you'll have seen this diagram, which is the sort of conceptual decision tree used by NL in a number of its case studies. So it doesn't go into the details of the specific in-house decision-making, which has some confidential steps, but I think it, it, it illustrates quite well why Secular Firm decided to use decision trees as a, as a tool to better understand the decision-making. And the, the value we found of, of, of the decision trees, but it, that it allows to clearly identify the points and the nodes in, in, in the decision-making process of a particular um, industry, business, where improved climate information and forecasts can be input. So introducing seasonal forecasts rather than the current use of, of climatology, for example. And importantly, also allows us to identify where best to um, assess the value of introducing the, the, the seasonal forecasting into the process. And Gertie, in, in her presentation, um, will we'll take us through the decision-making process and elaborate the decision tree for um, one particular case study. So, so we, we use the, the, the decision trees to provide visualizations of key decisions, especially the climate-driven ones, but also importantly, recognizing that, that, that for any business, climate is not the only factor that needs to be taken into account. And that's something I think Steve will explore with us a little bit later on. Um, and I, th I think the other um, use we made of, uh, of the decision trees was um, how to address this problem that's already been touched on in some of the discussions about how to sort of bring in the, the probabilistic format, the probabilistic nature of, of seasonal forecasting, current decision making. So how to move from a climatology, which is sort of essentially is, is, is one number, to a probabilistic forecast. I think the the other thing to say, which I think is is very self evident and, and and certainly came out in the breakout group that I was in earlier on, is that the the, the specific decision making context and the process depend very clearly on the particular sector, but also on the particular end user and and their decision within that particular sector. So even within a particular sector, even within a particular um, company, um, there, there are different decisions and therefore different needs being taken. So I don't want to take up any more time with the introduction because I think the, the case study presentations that, that we're going to, to hear next will, will illustrate um, the, the sector and user specific aspects very clearly. So we'll, we'll hear from, from Gertie from the energy sector, Leah from the water sector, and Antonio um, from the agriculture sector. So Gertie, over to you. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so we're gonna hear, as um, uh, Claire rightly said, we're gonna hear from Gertie uh, around the 
energy sector. Taxi, over to you. Yes, I'm trying to uh, uh, share my screen. Did that work? Did not work, did it? Yeah, it's worked. You just need to put it on presentation mode for us. All oh, right, okay. And, and uh, maximize your screen on there because other, we can see, there we go. Yeah, okay, thanks. Um, and we'll talk about uh, case study six, but also a bit about case study seven. And Claire has asked me specifically also to uh, inform you about how the decision tree was developed and how it is used. Um, the development, um, first of all, uh, Volmer Kricken, Hans de Vries from KNMI, Martijn de Ruiter, Mariana Mihic from TMET have, have been participating in this case study. And case study seven is closely linked to case study six. And I will come back to that later. So it's about the North Sea wind and wave conditions and the impact on maintenance planning and logistics. And specifically wind and wave conditions suitable for maintenance. So here you can see that uh, six and seven are closely related, though for case study six, we uh, focus on the Dutch North Sea part and the wind parks for that in that part. These were developed during and will be developed after this, uh, e, uh, after this project. So it was a new experience also for Tenet and for KNMI to see what kind of questions there are for Tenet to address. And one of the first workshops, this has the decision tree has been developed together with uh, Jan Upton from Shell and Hannah Brown from uh, Met Office and the other colleagues from Met Office. And um, a cartoonist translation of the decision tree has been made by Laurel. There are different vessels to approach the rigs or the uh, wind parks. And there are different durations of maintenance and um, it can go from the extremes of a couple of hours of calm conditions with, which are necessary up to five to 10 days of calm conditions. John already showed the uh, rig move example and we recently also had the cable repair example, which was during uh, December. The probability forecast related to acceptable risk and resulting in a go, no go is what we are aiming for. And we have provided a, a website to inform the end user of the result. The next thing is the decision tree itself. Climatological data and model output and seasonal forecasts are used to predict the wind and wave conditions. And I will show you an example for wave height, significant wave height lower than three and a half meter or a wind speed lower than 30 knots. And the example is, can be interchanged by any example because it depends on the, uh, on the vessel size and on the specific um, maintenance or corrective action needed. So this is not a static decision tree. It can change depending on the actual um, rig move or the actual corrective maintenance or the preventive maintenance. And then either postpone or uh, depending on the probability that it's calm weather the, um, the end user decides whether to uh, go ahead or not go ahead, and that depends on uh, booking possibilities of vessels, scheduling teams, and scheduling the work itself. So there are many aspects important in the end decision, and the weather part is the part that we are concentrating on. As John already said in his presentation, preventive, preventive maintenance is costly, but not as costly as a corrective maintenance, which is hugely costly. So this is the decision tree, which we used to make um, a dedicated user-friendly forecast using a website. And you see here the website, the dashboard, we call it, uh, for the different locations in the North Sea. And we have added also location of the of the rig move of uh, shell what you can see on this page is that there are different buttons that the end user can use he can select website or wind speed he can select the forecast time and the threshold 
and also the acceptable risk. And below you can see that the climatology has also been changed into a probability forecast. So you have uh, this black lines are the climatology, a 5%, a 50% or a 95% uh, forecast probability depending on climatology. So the baseline is the climatology and the blue line are the forecast. And this has been translated using the threshold of the end user and the acceptable risk, because as, as we said already, uh, preventive maintenance is different from a corrective maintenance. If there is an urgency, you have to act and the acceptable risk is much larger than because you already have an urgency. The threshold together with the acceptable risk can be translated using this information into a go, no go situation. And what you can see here, what the idea is to make a presentation as user-friendly as possible. And that is also what SECTI firm has um, brought us. Um, the interaction with the end user makes it possible to have a completely fresh view of how to use the climate forecast. There is so noise somewhere. Okay, um, so what I showed here is the translation of the decision tree into a user-friendly website. And the idea is to also get acquainted with possibilities or probabilities. But I think that many end users already are aware of probabilities. They have to use their acceptable risk continuously. In the near future, we will add climatological information on the North Sea wind wave and wave heights and investigate options for upgrade to operational services. In, I have a small, if I still have time, I have a small example of a recent situation in the first week of April this year. There was a very high significant wave height, also a large, uh, very high wind speeds actually. And you may have uh, read in the newspaper that there were quite some accidents with uh, large vessels and even uh, uh, people that had to be um, evacuated from the vessel because it, um, it was going towards the cliffs of Norway. And what we can see in our forecast system is that already a couple of weeks before, we saw a large probability of high uh, significant wave heights and shorter towards the real-time situation. It was even more prominent. And a couple of days before the accidents, the wave height was extremely much larger than the 95 percentile of the uh, climatological uh, distribution. So we could see a signal of this situation already a couple of weeks beforehand. And this is due to the trial service that we have made for SECLI firms specifically. So I would say this is quite an interesting result from SECLI firm and the interaction with the end user. Great. Thank you, Herti. So we're, as we said, we'll be taking some questions just towards the end of this session. Uh, and now we're going to move into another case study sector specific around water and we're going to hear from Leah Jackson Blake. Over to you Leah. Hi everyone. Let's get set up. Okay so yeah I'm uh, Leah Jackson Blake um, from the uh, Norwegian Institute for Water Research, and I'll just go through a couple of uh, case study examples from the WaterX project. Um, so to introduce briefly, um, so there are many uh, potential benefits of using seasonal climate forecasts um, in the water sector. Uh, freshwater management is challenging. Um, freshwaters are required to provide many services. Um, it's not uncommon for a single river or a reservoir to be uh, managed for many or even all of these uh, points that I've uh, I put here, um, which is obviously difficult. Um, and um, 
And then freshwater notes are also very sensitive to seasonal climate. So uh, droughts, floods and associated water quality problems can make this uh, even, uh, even harder. Uh, for example, um, providing drinking water from uh, either of these two uh, reservoirs that I've pictured here, difficult, expensive, impossible um, in some cases. So um, advanced warning could allow for mitigation strategies with uh, great potential benefits, economic, ecological, societal. Um, so the WaterX project, um, it's a four year project, which we're just finishing. Um, and the aim there was to, to co-develop um, pilot tools um, for seasonal prediction. Um, sorry, just uh, getting lots of notifications of the people. Um, so, um, so here's our generalized workflow um, down here. And so for, in some applications, seasonal climate forecasts can be used um, directly or with just a, a small amount of uh, post-processing um, to inform management. Uh, but when it comes to um, forecasts of say uh, stream flow, reservoir water level, water quality um, for, for the coming season, um, well, that depends not only on the seasonal climate for that season, but also what's happened in the run up to the season. So has it been wet, dry, snowy? Um, these things are also really important for what's going to happen next. Um, and so you need to have some kind of impact model, I've called it, um, which integrates seasonal climate forecast as well as um, history of what's happened and the nature of the, of the, the system. Is it a big lake, a small lake to get your, your management relevant summary for the next season? So that's our general workflow that we've followed. Um, but then a big part of the project was co-development. Um, we've heard that a few times today. So researchers and end users working uh, together really closely to develop tailored solutions um, so that the forecast can really support decision-making. Five um, case study sites. Uh, and here I'm just gonna take a very brief look at two of them. Um, the Sao Reservoir in Southern, uh, sorry, in Spain, not southern Spain, um, and uh, Lake uh, Vansha in Norway. So very different uh, geoclimatically, uh, geoclimatically, of course, um, but lots of similarities too. Um, so they're both managed for drinking water. They're really important drinking water sources. Um, they're also managed to provide flood protection and they're important recreational areas. Um, and bathing, boating, and so on. Um, common challenges in both sites then. Uh, Flooding is a big issue. Uh, high flows deliver poor quality water. Um, in Sal Reservoir in particular, that can lead to really expensive uh, water treatment for drinking water. Um, and uh, toxic cyanobacterial blooms are an issue in both sites as well. Um, despite these similarities, I'm gonna just show you now um, that, uh, that the seasonal climate forecasts were incorporated into our, our workflows um, in very different ways. Um, I'm just gonna use this to highlight the, the importance of tailoring climate services to end user needs, which is challenging uh, when it comes to generalizing the application of climate services um, across a sector. Um, so let's start with Sal Reservoir. Uh, so the end user there was a drinking water company. And as I've said, they were really interested in, uh, in hydrology forecasts for the next season. Oh. Um, and when we were talking about seasonal forecasts in our project, we were talking about um, the conditions over the next um, one to four months. And their um, forecasts usually come in the format of um, the probability of the most likely tercile. So will stream flow be uh, below normal, normal or above normal? Um, and that information was thought to be uh, really uh, interesting um, for our end user. They, they could really envisage ways they could use that um, to inform their management. They were also really interested in the risk of extremes, so really high flow or low flow um, and water levels. Um, but that couldn't be provided with any confidence at a seasonal, for, at a seasonal time scale. Um, for water yeah. quality, uh, as I said, that was a big problem for them. They were really interested in seasonal forecasts, water quality. Um, most of the things they were interested in could be correlated with either stream flow or water temperature. So we decided to focus on those as the most basic but important parameters um, to provide seasonal forecasts for, um, just in the first instance, really. Um, they were interested in being able to run the workflow themselves or at least access detailed forecasting information. So quite high technical competence there. Um, so. The, the workflow we came up with then was um, uh, a chain of process-based models going from seasonal climate, 
climate to hydrology model to a lake model um, and then the outputs you see down here. Um, in Norway, by contrast, then, um, so as I said before, they were interested in, um, in hydrology forecasts, but there, this, um, this forecast of the, the Tercel um, was not thought to be relevant. They wouldn't uh, use that to change their management. They were only interested in, uh, in the extremes, which, as I said before, we couldn't do with any confidence. So hydrology was dropped there from that workflow. Um, but they were still very interested in cyanobacteria risk and uh, wanted a simple text summary um, to interpret the forecast. So here we picked um, as our workflow, a simple empirical model, a Bayesian belief network, going directly from uh, the lake and weather data to the algal bloom risk. So, so bypassing the sort of complex hydrology modeling. Um, and in both cases, and in all our case studies, uh, in fact, um, our end users were excited about the potential for in improved decision-making. Um, based on the forecast. And here's just some examples of ways they envisaged, um, some of the decisions they envisaged sort of taking based on them. So in Spain, the, the water level forecasts and the stream flow forecasts together um, could be used to sort of give an indication that they should lower or raise the water level in advance of the season, and also to store extra water in an upstream reservoir where it would be buffered from uh, poor water quality that's delivered during high flow events. Um, and in Vansha, the cyanobacteria bloom risk forecast um, would be used to um, just for preparedness, really. So um, blooms usually occur in July when all Norwegians are on holiday. Um, so usually that there aren't staff available for sampling. So if the bloom risk was high, they'd make sure people were, were ready to take samples from the popular bathing beaches. So you can see some really different workflows and potential ways that the forecast would be used in decision making in these two sites. Um, and I should say in, in all our case studies, there were, there were issues of trust and, uh, and confidence and so on, which, which we touched on um, earlier in the day. So just briefly, some other more general lessons that we, we learned along the way um, and summarizing uh, a little bit from just the literature as well. Um, so as I mentioned then, um, seasonal flow and water quality forecasts can perform well due to a, a combination of what the seasonal climate um, forecast says, as well as knowledge of, um, of the what's happened in the, in the system in the run-up to that, that target season. Um, and where seasonal climate forecasts perform well, um, then they tend to have great potential added value for management. But that's not always the case. Um, as, we've, as we've talked about already today, um, seasonal climate forecasting skill can be uh, patchy outside the tropics. Um, the good news is that, uh, that forecasts that only rely so stream flow, lake water level, water quality forecasts um, that only rely on the on previous or initial conditions can be very useful in themselves, which is good, performing um, often better than just climatology. Um, and then finally, where seasonal climate forecast skill is low um, or just limited to certain windows of opportunity, um, then added value is most likely, and therefore it's most likely sort of investing in forecasting systems that use uh, seasonal climate forecasts. Um, in systems where, um, which have high sensitivity to seasonal climate, so smaller, flashier catchments and reservoirs, um, and where the, the benefits of any windows of opportunity are, are large. Um, so that was a very quick run through. Um, I've just listed here some sources of additional information. If you're interested, uh, please feel free to get in touch. Um, many thanks to the whole WaterX team, our funders, and to you. Cheers. Great. Great. Oh, thank you, Leah. Um, so as a, again, just to remind people that we're going to have a question and answer session after we finish um, all of the sessions today. So um, we are now going to hear uh, a case study from the agricultural sector. And I'd like to welcome to the front um, Antonio Graca, who's going to share with us a med gold and so great um, case study. Antonio, over to you. Thank you, Gary. Um, let me try. Well, I'm getting here a message that my sharing is disabled by the host. I can't hear you, Gary. You should be able to share, Antonio. I'm not quite sure. I have your slides if you want me to share them anyway. I think it will be best because I'm not being able to share right now. OK, just bear with me then while I um... Get your slides up for you. 
Okay. Pronto. I'll do that for you now. So you just need to tell me when to move on, yeah? Okay. Right, so you can move to the next one, please. Right, so um, I will be uh, showcasing you uh, some of the results we are having on Project uh, Mad Gold, which is an, an H2020 uh, project uh, started about three years ago. Next slide, please. So I wonder if uh, you uh, can uh, uh, have an idea of what is uh, the hardest decision to make about wine. I mean, if you are a wine lover, uh, probably for you, the, the hardest decision is which wine to pick up from the shelf. A met of if it's Merlot, a Copernicus Carbonet, a Noah Nebbiolo. This is usually a difficult decision for many um, uh, wine drinkers. However, if you are on the production side, next slide, please. Uh, hardest decisions, uh, harder decisions need to be made. For instance, where are you going to bury your capital for the next 30 to 50 years, which is the decision you have to make when you decide to plant a vineyard? Or when you already have a vineyard, when is the moment that you should get in the vineyard and do a spraying in order to protect your investment against the ravages of disease? Next slide, please. So, um, and this is just a point I wanted to make in the way that wine can be thought of as climate information that is held together in a very pleasant way that elicits emotions from those enjoying it. A climate service should be climate data held together by wisdom in order to provide the necessary information for decisions and correct decisions to be made. Next slide, please. So the Medgold project uh, uh, tackled this um, uh, situation in um, converting climate related information into added value for three traditional agri-food sectors of the Mediterranean, the grape wine sector, the olive olive oil sector, and the durum wheat pasta uh, sector. So the project uh, created um, uh, um, uh, an information platform, uh, which is uh, an uh, a series of algorithms, of course, that draws climate raw data from uh, several sources, but mostly from uh, Copernicus data store and then uh, processes that data and provides it under different visualization uh, services, one of which was fully developed during the project, which is the Medgold dashboard that I will be using later during this uh, uh, presentation. Next slide, please. So let's look at the decision of planting a vineyard. So uh, you have to have in mind what type of wine you want to make and also what is the level of yields and quality that you require in order for your business to, uh, to thrive. Once you have those two um, uh, informations, you'll have to decide what type of vineyard you are going to plant um, looking for varieties, rootstocks, and also the siting of that vineyard, so that as a, fa uh, as a function of the climate and the soil you have on that site, you can use those great vines to, provide, to produce the wine you want. Next slide, please. So Medgold um, has this um, dashboard uh, uh, facility um, that um, allows you to look into long-term projections according to two different uh, emission scenarios and for two different time horizons in the future from 2031 to 2060 to a number of uh, climate variables, mostly temperature and uh, precipitation related, but also bioclimatic uh, indices, which are um, computations of essential climate variables uh, towards uh, effects that are uh, uh, impacting the crop and impacting the behavior of the vineyard. In the, in the case I am showing here, this is growing season average temperature, which is the average uh, uh, monthly temperatures between um, April and October. 
And these relate directly to the type of grape variety that you can grow to produce quality wine. So you can look into the future and see um, that, uh, for instance, on this particular spot of the Portuguese Douro Valley, the value, the average value of the GST would be above 20 degrees. And looking at the um, chart on the right side, we can see that pretty much no uh, variety of those in there um, does behave well in terms of wine production at that temperature. So probably I would not choose that site to produce um, uh, high quality wine for the next 30 years um, in, in, in this uh, area. Next slide, please. So looking at the um, uh, decision of, um, of operational management of your vineyards, and in this specific case, deciding whether to spray or not, these are, of course, decisions that are made on a much shorter um, uh, time frame. Usually you have to, them, uh, to, to, to make them every year and several times during the year. So the, the factors involved here uh, have got to do with the stocks of protection products that you have, but also the availability of labor or machinery to do uh, uh, the work. It's got to do with the development of the vineyard, how much leaf surface you've got, what is the phenological state the vineyard is at uh, a specific moment, and especially at the moment that driven by climate and the specific pathogen involved, a disease may uh, break out on your vineyard. Next slide, please. So in the, in the dashboards from Medgold, we also have seasonal forecasts that allow us to peer into the next seven months and, um, and uh, uh, understand what is the likelihood of having any of the, um, the, the variables involved, be it the climate essential variables, bioclimatic indices, or in this case, um, risk indicators, um, uh, that's, uh, what is the situation that you are bound to have if it is uh, same as normal, above normal, or uh, below normal. On top of that, you can also um, uh, decide to filter out those areas where there is no skill, uh, which is as we are um, uh, looking at this screen right now. Uh, if you look at the bottom left corner, you have a skill off, skill on, and it is on right now. So we are looking at the forecast for the, um, the sanitary risk for the season of this year. And we see that several areas have skill whether, while others do not have skill. And also you can look into the accuracy of the forecasts for the past uh, 30 years uh, by looking at the chart below where the blue dots are observations and the um, square, the colored squares are the forecasts. Next slide, please. So in the project, um, uh, several issues uh, were, um, were, were uh, relevated regarding uh, the actual relationship that users may have with this type of services. They all boil down to the, the time needed uh, by the user to process the information he gets until he is able to decide on an action. And that processing time uh, has been demonstrated to, um, to be affected, among other things, by these three uh, factors. Uh, the, the, the wording being used in the, in the information provide, the semantics, the coherence between the information provide and the decision that it needs to inform, and of course, the trust regarding the accuracy uh, that the information has in order to reduce the risk of decision so that value may be brought onto it. Next slide, please. So, oh. sorry. Yeah, so bottom line, um, it's pretty much when you get out of your office and you have to rush to the next wine store because you have uh, bring your own bottle uh, uh, dinner with your friends and you are facing 300 different wines without really having much time uh, to process the information on the labels and deciding which is the wine that um, will suit the occasion and won't make you look bad, which um, 
creates a situation very similar to what many users in the agricultural uh, sector um, uh, face uh, when getting uh, uh, climate information in order to make a decision regarding their operations. Next slide, please. And this is about it. I'm just leaving you with these two quotes from two important documents uh, um, published two years ago, calling the attention to the fact that uh, uh, we need, in, in fact, actionable information and uh, information that realistically represents the environment in order to uh, farmers being able to use uh, it and, and, uh, and derive value from it. Thank you very much and cheers, everybody. That's great. Thank you very much, Antonio. Uh, so we've heard now uh, from three different sectors. And what we're going to do now is just lead through those case studies into uh, um, a session led by Steve Dorling, as you heard earlier from UEA, who is going to talk to us a little bit and help us um, prepare a decision tree. Steve, over to you. Hello, Gary. Can you see me? Uh, slides OK and hearing me OK? Yeah, all good. Just if you put them in present mode and then we're good to go. There we go. Perfect. Well, hello, everybody, and um, thanks for staying with us. Um, just before I uh, explain my choice of title here, um, we've got a little uh, exercise. In fact, there's two things I'm going to ask you to help me with during this presentation. Um, the first one um, is described on this slide here. Um, and it's going to require the uh, help that I'm hoping Gary and the team can help with, with the Mentimeter tool. And what I'd like everybody to do, please, is to think about interactions with um, either a climate service provider, or if you're, a, uh, if you're a, a developer or a provider of uh, climate services, then thinking about interactions that you have with, with clients or users. So whichever side of that fence you're on, um, please have in mind a partner that you are working with. And the question that I'd like to ask you, please, is to uh, help us to record in a short sentence or just a few words, one characteristic which explains your choice of favorite partner when you're working together uh, on producing or using a service. And what I'd like you to do in particular is not to name that person or that organization, but just to describe for us, please, what's good about working with them? What makes it an effective partnership? So I'm gonna hold uh, hand back to Gary now to help us to access the Mentimeter tool. Steve, if you could just stop the share, that would be great. Okay, and then I'm going to ask my uh, colleague, Justine. So you will see um, in the chat, there is a link. If you click on the link, it says www.menti.com and then a, a code, and that will take you directly to the questions. And you should be able to contribute your, your responses. So there are two questions. You can see the first one is about the provider and the second one is about the user. So click on the link and you should go straight to the questions. We'll give you a few seconds, few minutes to respond. And then we'll pause on question one and we'll move to question two. So question one is about the climate service provider. Let's leave it running for a bit longer. And you can see the responses coming through in the format of a word cloud. We can see that 10 people have contributed, 11, 12. Let's just leave it a bit longer, Justine. Wow, I haven't seen this tool working before, Gary. Uh, really nice. Yeah, it's good, isn't it? It's a nice one. So lots of things coming through. Open-minded, 
transparency, user friendly, robust science, good at listening. Mm, tra transparency and methods. I like that one. Yeah. And here we are on. Oh, you've gone back, Justine. Okay. Let's go to the second question then. So the second question is about taking it from the other angle, right, Steve? This is about um, a characteristic that best explains your choice of favorite client or user, putting yourself in the other in, in the other camp. So again, respond to the question and we'll see the um, responses on the screen. I'll give you a couple of minutes to do that. And then we'll just take a quick review. We've got this one set up to uh, represent the data in a slightly different way. So willing to learn was our first one. First, first <laughs> vote in was willing to learn. Engaged, inquisitive, open-minded comes up again. Innovative, willing to try new things. Okay, we'll give this one a, a minute more. Yeah, I really have this feeling of teamwork here, of, of, of wanting to engage with a user who uh, is, is, is keen to work together to solve the problem. Definitely. Okay, so let's just pause that there, Justine, and then can we go back to the, pre the first question? Thank you. So Steve, anything you want to pick out from the word cloud specifically? So this well, was about uh, provider. Yeah, it, it, indeed. And later on in my presentation, actually, I'm going to mention the idea that um, when we're working with decision trees, that it isn't, I think, always about thinking about the decision tree at the user's end. There's also the question of the decision tree at the provider's end. So how do we as service providers think about the options available to us for powering a service? So uh, that's why I particularly looked at the one there that said transparency in methods, because I think we need to be under the microscope as well. Okay, and Justine, can you just flick to the second question for us? And some of the things that came out here, you already said about working together. Yeah, and inquisitive, that's a lovely word, isn't it? You know, we're, we're trying to uh, progress, we're trying to learn, we're trying to find new ways of getting insight um, from climate service information. Um, so I, I think um, that that's one that catches my eye. Um, but again, um, you know, looking for engagement, uh, looking for forward thinking. I like that phrase as well. You know, we're, we're trying to move the move the dial um, as we as we progress together. Right. Thanks, Justine. And then we're going to hand back to Steve. Who's, you can re, uh, restart sharing yours now, Steve. Thank you. And um, Gary, just to check my timing here, I'm running through to when, please. Sorry, Area. you've got. You've, sorry, I realised I was on mute. Yeah, you've got about twenty-five minutes, Steve. Plenty of time. Okay, perfect. So, um, last week, um, a colleague of mine asked if, if if we could meet together to to have a chat about something this lunchtime, and I explained that I was participating in this Seckley firm workshop. And so my friend said, "Oh, what's the workshop about? What are you What are you speaking about?" So I said, I'm talking about climate services and decision trees. And my friend doesn't work in this sector. Um, so they looked at me and said, climate and trees, forgetting the, the critical words of, 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 of decision and, and services. Um, climate and trees, yeah, trees are really important for climate, aren't they? And Obviously, that wasn't the point I was trying to get across, but actually it made me reflect on the purpose of this presentation and, and what we've been talking about during the workshop today. Um, and it made me go back and think about climate and trees. And so when I Googled around this, 
recognizing, of course, that my friend was right, that trees are really important for climate. I found these three quotes on uh, a BBC news item, uh, which I thought were quite good, uh, not only in reflecting uh, important state of science, but also making me reflect a little bit on decision trees. So planting the right trees in the right place must be a top priority for all nations as we face a crucial decade for ensuring the future of our planet. So said Paul, Dr. Paul Smith, a researcher on the study and Secretary General of Conservation Charity, Botanic Gardens Conservation International at Kew, uh, at Kew Gardens. So trees are important for climate. In fact, they're crucial. Next up, tree planting is a brilliant solution to tackle climate change and protect biodiversity, but the wrong tree in the wrong place can do more harm than good. Okay, so trees are really important, but we need to make sure that we have the right kind of tree to solve the problem that we're facing. And then finally, actually planting trees is highly complex with no universal easy solution. Um, so that's what I reflected on and thinking about, therefore, that uh, if we extend that thinking from trees to decision trees, that actually the initial day when you think that a decision tree could be useful, which is what happened in the Seckley Fern project towards the beginning of our, our, our work together, um, when you start to implement that, actually there's more to it than meets the eye. That's the message that I want to come across here, that uh, trees, decision trees, uh, both can be really useful tools, but we need to implement them well and we need to think critically about them and take the positives and not the negatives. Now, I'm a, a natural scientist um, and uh, I work with data and models a lot. Uh, and so my own natural um, interaction with uh, decision trees uh, tends to focus more regularly on the side of uh, the sort of decision tree that you see on the right hand side of this slide. Um, so I just pick up my laser pointer here and um, highlight the fact that some decision trees are very rule based and they have lots of numbers and they have lots of if then type statements. And I just wanted to uh, tell you a little bit about where this particular decision tree has come from. So we've been working on a project uh, that has been funded through the Newton Fund under the Weather and Climate Sciences for Services Partnership, India. And this is a program that's coordinate, coordinated by our friends at the UK Met Office. So we've been working on a project which has all been all about um, fog risk in India. And you can see from this schematic diagram here, taken from the Times of India newspaper, that fog is becoming an increasing problem in northern India. The number of deaths related to fog hazards um, uh, has been increasing in recent times, and people naturally are very interested in trying to understand uh, what is driving that growth. It's a very interesting scientific problem. Um, as well as being a crucial one from a societal perspective. So we developed this uh, rule-based decision tree on the right-hand side here, um, which tries to understand um, what type of fog uh, is likely to occur on any given day. So a rather uh, scientific question, but the point we started with with our work was to try to understand um, if we know the type of fog that's being formed, uh, then we can recognize what kind of conditions our weather, our weather models need to accurately simulate in order to provide better warnings. So this is um, a little bit different to what we've been doing in the Secli Firm project, of course, but it did generate the sort of rule-based decision tree um, that I'm trying to uh, describe to you. Of course, this is only one kind of decision tree, but it's sort of one classic example of a rule-based system. The colors on here on the decision tree represent different types of fog. 
I'm not going to go into the details of those uh, because that's not the purpose of showing you this, but it's just to point out that at one end of a spectrum, decision trees can be represented uh, in the form of rule-based, very numerical type guides. And that was my starting point for recommending that we perhaps ought to adopt decision trees in the Seckley Firm project. Uh, so a number of years ago, I had that kind of rule-based uh, decision tree in my head, thinking that we might well be able to produce something similar in each of our case studies in the Seckley Firm project. And I guess what I've learned over the last three to four years um, in working with colleagues on the Seckley Firm project, and indeed with, with our partners uh, in industry, is that actually, it may not be the decision tree itself that's so useful. Uh, rather, it may be that decision trees are helpful for provoking useful conversations. And actually, I think that that's something that we've heard confirmed by many of the other speakers in this workshop, is that um, it, it's not just the details that are um, uh, described in a decision tree uh, that are useful. It's the fact that each side has to ask good questions of the other uh, in order to get a good uh, conversation going and to develop insight as to what the problem is. And so I'm just going to go through with you here a few bullets of um, things that I reflected on uh, uh, good things uh, that come out of those conversations and to look back through our workshop today and to make a few links to what others have, have, have said during the conversation. And please, as I go, if you feel like putting something in the chat and, and uh, hopefully Gary will interrupt me as I go uh, uh, to get your thinking, or indeed, of course, we can pick up your thoughts uh, at the end. But I, I want this to be a sort of reflective um, uh, approach where we look back both through the Secly Firm project itself and back through the, the, the nice discussions that we've had uh, during today's workshop. So I think that when we say to our colleagues, when we say to our partners um, as we try to develop a decision tree, um, the first thing that we try to be clear about together is what is the, the decision that we're assisting with? What is the problem that our, uh, our colleagues are facing and how can we help? That of course is the starting point for any icebreaker decision tree process. I, I deliberately use the word icebreaker here because I honestly think that by giving ourselves the task of producing a decision tree, that, that actually um, it's a great icebreaker for the conversation that we need to have. Now, one of the um, key points, of course, in addition to understanding the decision that needs to be made, is that we also uh, need to understand where are we starting from um, in working alongside our, our partners. Um, so that's been mentioned several times today where um, our colleagues have talked about the fact that they may already have been working with, um, let's say, short range weather forecast information, and the challenge we've been facing in Secli Firm and the opportunity has been to extend that familiarity with short range weather information and to extend it into the monthly or seasonal time range. So it's only really through the conversation provoked by the decision tree that we um, get a sight of uh, the type of weather information that our users uh, have already got some familiarity with. So where are we starting from in terms of the use of, of weather and climate information? Now, I, I spend some of my time in um, delivering operational weather and climate services. And my experience over some years of, of doing that has tended to indicate that the drivers um, that uh, users have, many users have, for uh, needing that kind of support can fall into one or more of, of three motivations, three different categories. Um, I, I find that lots of people use this information for the purposes of improving safety. Some use it exclusively for thinking about improving their productivity. 
and others will be using weather information to ensure that their operations uh, optimise environmental protection. And of course, many will be using perhaps more than one of those motivations. And so for me, um, when we're discussing needs, when we're developing decision trees, um, this is the context uh, that I find very regularly when I'm talking with potential users about their interest in weather and climate services. Um, we've heard numerous times uh, during the workshop today uh, mention of, of, of these motivations and um, it's good in the conversations around decision trees to have clarity on, on, on where's the end goal, what's the motivation for this. Now in the breakout sessions that we had earlier on, um, uh, one of the questions was about barriers. Um, so what is stopping you from using a seasonal forecast climate service, for example? Um, and I think that the decision tree process has been quite helpful actually for identifying um, what the barriers are, how we might be able to together overcome them. And indeed, um, uh, perhaps if we uh, think about navigating around them uh, as another way of uh, moving forward together. So there are barriers. We've got those recorded now on the, um, uh, on the mural uh, tool. And uh, certainly the sector firm team will be reflecting on those uh, at the end of this workshop and sharing thoughts with you. One of the most interesting things I found um, in this exercise and in the Seckley Firm project is um, when we try to make progress together, when we try to uh, work together alongside users, is uh, the conversation that goes around who at the user's end we need to get involved in the project. And indeed, who at the climate services uh, end we need to get involved. So what do I mean by that? Well, often we come together, um, perhaps an individual on the climate service side and perhaps an individual on the user's side. But pretty soon we find that we need to engage our colleagues uh, in order to elaborate how the climate service um, should ideally develop. So on the climate service um, developers end, uh, we may find that we need an expert um, who uh, actually can articulate uh, the, the, the service in an effective user-friendly way. So we may need a designer at our end to help with that. And then at the user's end, what we may find is that actually climate services are relevant in multiple areas of their business. And what that means is that we may be looking at a situation where uh, our user needs to engage with their colleagues in different departments with different motivations. Um, and they may need to do that because collectively, um, the user may need to come to a collective decision on how to use or implement the climate service uh, offering. So pretty soon through this process of conversation, driven by the need for a decision tree, we suddenly discover that there are many more people that we may need to involve in the conversation. And I've found that it's only actually through trying to get something down on paper through a decision tree uh, that we identify who we need uh, in order to uh, make progress with that. One aspect of that, which I think is crucial, uh, is that we should remember that climate service information is only one piece of information which the user is um, making use of uh, in order to make a decision. I think as climate service providers, we sometimes forget that. We um, we'll sometimes forget that the advice that we provide needs to interface well with other information that the user is routinely using. So, um, I think the decision tree process has revealed for me um, the reality, which is that our system, our climate service, needs to interface well with other decision support information at the user's end. And one of the barriers here will undoubtedly be that if our climate service does not interface with other support systems that the user has, we need to try and be aware of what those interfaces are 
and to work hard to make systems work seamlessly together. Now, I suppose I've already spoken then through the uh, previous bullets uh, on a general theme, which is that I find that the production of a decision tree, getting everything down on paper, trying to see where the key decision nodal points are, I just see it as a generic exercise in the de-risking of any project. We need to get stuff down out on the table and down on paper in order to understand uh, where the opportunities are in working together, but also where the obstacles are. And if we do that well, then I think we stand a much better chance of our collaboration together being successful. So project de-risking, uh, I think, can be facilitated through the use of decision trees, which are provoking these conversations that uh, we, we need to have. And then uh, my final bullet here is to say that uh, as I mentioned towards the beginning, I don't think this is just about a decision tree describing the decision process at the user's end. I think there's a lot we can do at the climate service provider's end to articulate down in a similar way uh, the decisions we're making about which models, uh, which timescales, um, which sources of data we're using. We need transparency at that end as well in order to develop the trust which our users have um, expressed that they really want to have with us. So we need to put ourselves under the microscope and think about our decision-making process as well. So my final request, if I may, um, is to ask you all at the end of all of that, um, which camp, if I can put it that way, you put yourselves in. When you think about decision trees and, and uh, how we've seen they can be useful, and you can think of my decision tree here if you like, or you can think of any of the decision trees that colleagues have um, presented during the workshop. I wonder whether you feel that a decision tree is most useful if it takes the form of this rule-based type uh, presentation on the right hand side here. If X is greater than Y, do this. If Z is greater than A, do that. Um, is that kind of presentation of a decision tree what you have in mind? Or at the end of this workshop, is it the words that come out of the conversations provoked by decision trees uh, that you think is the most valuable outcome from this exercise. So I'm asking you basically to put yourself in the camp of words or numbers. Do you like the wordy descriptions, the insight that comes from conversations, um, the words that Antonio was speaking about in his previous presentation, uh, where the users like to see words that they find familiar? Or do you think that the number rule-based approach is uh, the one which makes a decision tree approach uh, particularly useful? So oh. I'm gonna hand back to Gary now to uh, help us to go back and revisit Mural. No, we're not, gonna go, we're, we're not gonna go to Mural. We're gonna do it okay. in a Zoom poll. Oh, marvelous. So uh, I'm gonna open a poll, which everyone on the Zoom call will be able to see. It's a single choice answer. So you cannot, you cannot pick both, you can only pick one. So I'm gonna start the poll now and then you will see it pop up on your screen and then we'll share the results. So here it comes. And there's no right answer, everybody. We want your perspective. So we'll just leave it a bit longer. You can speak too soon as you watch these um, watch these results varying. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, you should have it on your screens. So just a couple more seconds. Oh, some people are not seeing the question. 
Okay. I suspect the co-hosts can't presenters can't can't yeah. vote, so I'm no. feeling frustrated. <laughs> Sorry, it's the it's because you were co-hosting. <laughs> yeah. yeah that's... Okay, I'm going to end it there. So. Well, well I, I think what's really interesting about those results is is that the fact that there's almost a balance um, is important because it basically shows that when we're working with others in our own organization or, or, or with users, um, that we have to remember that some people will find one approach more helpful and others will find something else. So being mindful of that, I think, is the lesson that I take from this. OK. Oh. Steve, any final closing words? No other than to say uh, thank you for sticking with us, everybody. I know we're going to go to, to, to a discussion and, and questions and so forth now. Um, so I'm going to hand over to, to Alberto for that. Um, but I hope there was something interesting for you there. I've been more than happy to follow up with anybody after the workshop if you'd like to contact me. Um, please do. Um, I hope you found that useful. Great. Thank you, Steve. If you could just stop the share for us, that would be perfect. And then we are going to go to, <clears throat> excuse me, a panel Q&A again. So yeah, Steve, if you can just drop the share, that would be cool. I'm trying to do so, Gary. Um... I'm going to, I'll, I'll do it. Don't worry. I can there do it. There we go. I think there we're there. there. I think okay, we're cool. There. Great. Okay. So I think we're going to uh, open it up to the floor again. And as you can see, we will have uh, in the discussion here, uh, Alberto, and then we will also have Claire, Gerti, Leah, Antonio, and Steve. So let's open it up. If you've got a question, uh, please use the raise hand button, which is in the reactions button down the bottom of your screen, or type it in the chat and we will pick it up from there. Over to you, Alberto. Thank you, thank you, Gary. Thank you for the discussion on decision trees. I don't know whether the do we, uh, by the way, want to spend a bit of time to uh, try to build one, or do we dedicate to question and answers? I wasn't sure whether you wanted to continue a bit more, Steve. Or... No. Okay. So let's go to questions and answers from the floor. Okay, so yeah, the, there's been some uh, interesting discussions also on the side here on the chat that I've been following with uh, the importance of having uh, translation between uh, the climate scientists and users. And, and uh, we all know in all these projects we discussed the importance of having this conversation, the, to be on the same page, and in fact, the time is taken um, to set up the scenes in these projects. It's um, considerable time that uh, most of us uh, hadn't anticipated. We thought that we'd go straight onto action and uh, tailor the forecast and so on. But uh, in actual fact, it's an experience that is shared by many uh, climate service projects that, that we ended up uh, spending this time uh, quite a bit of time at the beginning of the project to set the scenes, as I said. So on that note, um, maybe, I don't know if any of the my fellow panelists here would like to contribute. I've seen um, Antonio making several comments. I don't know if you want to go through them uh, verbally, expand a bit on that, and then uh, get the discussion going on this area. That, that includes also, you know, references to your specific sector, which is the, you know, the purpose of this session is to expand between en from energy, which was uh, and water, the focus of cycle firm to other sectors and see how that um, that flows between sectors. So, Antonio, would you like to expand Thank on you. your points? Okay, Alberto. Thank you. Um, yeah, I 
I was making a point, actually, a reflection that came up from hearing the first uh, minutes of Steve's uh, presentation uh, and reflecting back into my experience of both the Medgold and Euphoria's projects um, that actually in the beginning, users starting by uh, uh, wanting uh, something that is uh, not possible at this time scientifically. I mean, uh, because they want to solve their situation um, the best possible. And if someone asks uh, a user, what is the need you have from a climate service to uh, solve your decision making today? Most often than not, they will tell you something that it's just not possible. Um, at the same time, um, if you, you uh, take a provider and, um, and you ask them, what do you have that can help me in what I do? Uh, the first answer, the first thing that they will uh, show you is something that you look at and you say, well, that is nice, but doesn't really work for me, doesn't really bring much. And then it's when the conversation develops and uh, it needs several iterations and especially those iterations take time if you do not have what I call a translator, someone that makes sense of things that both are saying that are uh, uh, the, both are honestly conveying what they think, but they are being misunderstood by each other at the same time. Uh, I'm just giving you a very simple example. The word anomaly, for instance, for a climatologist is something quite trivial and quite neutral. But for a user, an anomaly is something that is bad. It's not, it's not normal, it's not usual, it's not, usually it's not good. So this type of translation is really important if you want to get the service developed in a way that is fruitful for both sides so that the science can be applied and value can be uh, derived. And um, if I were to set up a new team for a project uh, in, the, in the near future, uh, I would look very carefully for someone who can do this role, someone that has the experience of banging their head against this problem uh, so that they now know that it represents a major hurdle that needs to be overcome in the first place. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Antonio. That, that sets the scene well for other comments from the panel. If uh, we can, we have other comments. I don't know if uh, experience. Well, maybe I can, yeah, maybe yeah. I can just just come in here. I mean, I think I think kind of what we what we've learned in in Stackley firm and 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 very clearly also in in Medgold and Water XR is that the the sort of traditional way of eliciting user needs is 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 not very effective. I mean, that would typically be you know a list of a list of variables, temporal and spatial scales. And we and we went through that at, at, at Sackley Firm in in the very early stages, but I think what we've ended up with is something quite different, and and hopefully much more useful, usable, because it's it, it's more kind of focused on on, on the decision making um, processes, so it's more appropriate for informing um, decision making. But I think the other thing we've learned is that it's it is quite a quite a lengthy process. Um, it needs time and it needs trust. And I would agree with the with the comments in in the chat about the need to bring in other disciplines. So not just the not just the um, sort of climate services, not just the climate modelling community, but certainly I think it's a role for social sciences, communication experts, decision making experts. Okay, thank you, Claire. And just to throw things in the mix, I mean, do we also, uh, are we now in a position where the gap has been uh, um, filled a bit? So one of the risks of having this conversation uh, was, uh, would have been also, or could still be that, um, you know, the two camps are too far away and they, after uh, 30 minutes or 30, 60 minutes of discussion, they decide there's not much into in there for, for, for any of the parties and they, they depart in, um, in, in an amicable way, but then uh, the conversation doesn't continue. So that's a risk as well. 
uh, we seen uh, in this case, I mean, because it's part of the project that we have to continue. Whether we can, uh, we could have done better, yes, but um, whether at the time we could have done better, I don't know. I mean, in hindsight, I, I would say so. Um, you know, it, it, it wasn't possible. Um, I mean, there's always things, but I would say we've learned from the project how to deal with these situations now, how to. But the, the, the other aspect is, as well is that there are always new actors in the, in the sector and, and, and the, in, as in many fields, you need to start the conversation again, like when you meet a new person and say, my name is, and uh, I live here and so on. Um, you know, we have to go through the process all over again. I don't think there are necessarily shortcuts for that because you, you, you know, you need to go through that uh, discussion every time, but um, I'll let, um, I see Antonio, and then maybe if you can hear from others and people, everybody, please also put your questions on the chat. So yeah. we'll give so, you a chance in a minute. Alberto, Alberto, before we go to Antonio, Marcello had his hand raised first. Oh, sorry, I couldn't see it. No okay, worries. And then uh, Antonio and Steve, yeah. So Marcello, Antonio and Steve. Okay, perfect. So uh, one point I think it's very, very important that we didn't touch is really the risk perception because uh, let's suppose that we are able to think quantitatively and we could say that there is a risk for the next season of being very dry in Portugal. So the effect of this drought for Antonio could be completely different compared to the effect for a very small farmers, which means the total destruction of his uh, crop. And uh, uh, we have to add also this ingredient when we propose climate services, because the climate the risk perception and the effect that could bring to different actors could be completely different even if the input is the same, so the same drought or the same wetness. And this is something we have to think about, I believe. Okay, yeah, thank you, Marcello. So remember risk. Um, Tonya, please. Yes, I just wanted to, well, it, it actually follows up on what Marcello just said, but uh, taking something that was mentioned by Claire, which is the, 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 the factor of trust, and this cannot be uh, um, over, overstated. I mean, the whole thing runs around the trust you can get between both sides, between the provider and, 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 and the user. And that means that you have to understand, just as Marcello said, um, it, each side needs to understand the other. The, the, you, the, if you are a provider, you need to understand who the user is and what are his concerns and his, and his needs. Pretty much in the same way that if you, are, you want to be a good salesman, you need to understand what your client needs. It's pretty much the, the same. But on the other side, if you are a user and you want to have the, 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 uh, um, a proposal, a solution, a, a valuable solution, from, from a provider, you also have to understand what the who the provider is, what he knows, what he has done before. Because otherwise, um, you, you might be uh, um, uh, conveying the best you can your situation, but they just do not understand it. So many times I feel that um, one of the fastest ways to develop this type of, um, of solutions is having the providers uh, um, propose what they have. And once they have done that, to develop uh, with them together, uh, how can it be put to good use? And trust there is absolutely fundamental. First, because uh, um, the provider needs to trust that the user is able to use his tool. Uh, in the proper way, in the way that it was conceived to be to, to be used. But on the other hand, the user also needs to trust that the, 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 the provision that is being offered him brings any value. And this has been so important in the MedGold project that we had to host an, a workshop devoted only to trust and to, to actually understanding how it worked. It's very psychological. It's got a lot to do with the way people relate to each other. But there are a number of tools, a number of practices, mostly drawn from communication science that can be uh, applied here and should be applied here. I, I, I believe also that this is a lengthy process, but I, I believe that it doesn't have to be as lengthy as it has usually been. 
There are ways of making it uh, accelerate and especially covering the, the, the specific hurdles that are common to all projects. If you start from that in the beginning, usually the process should be faster. Yeah, thank you, Antonio. Yeah, and uh, I agree. I mean, it is um, obviously it's going to be faster uh, if if um, you know we demonstrate the positive experiences, particularly coming from the projects, and uh, other people see what what's coming out, and that that would uh, help a lot in the conversation because obviously if you have uh, something to refer to, you don't have to start from scratch. You can say you know that has worked for that particular case, and then so people start to gain confidence in in. Uh, in seasonal forecast, uh, in our case, or projections and so on, which uh, have a high level of uncertainty. And that's that's the main uh, I mean, issue with uh, using this kind of climate information. Steve, if I can ask uh, to keep comments now to 30 seconds, one minute, so we can... Sure, sure. So to three very quick points. Um, uh, it was Antonio, I think, who said in his presentation that whatever happens, the climate service needs to reduce decision risk. Um, if we're not in a position to do that over a period of time, over a period of years, uh, then, you know, it's very difficult to argue for, for, for this approach. Second of all, um, it, it can take time to build the trust and to work together. And I just wanted to speak up for secondment you know, people spending time with the other organization, um, embedding themselves for a period of time in order to gain insight and to make friends and, and you know, develop relationships, basically. Maybe we need a bit more of that and we need funding to, to perhaps support that kind of activity. Um, and then finally, I, I always wanted to ask Antonio and, and, and others working in the wine industry, um, of course, um, some parts of the wine sector are working on the concept of vintages. Um, you know, to have a great vintage, you also have to need to have some not great vintages. And, and, and so therefore, um, the impact of climate variability um, and, and the, uh, it, it, uh, the increase in yields and the decrease in yields, the increase in quality and the decrease in quality is all part of the um, uh, of the sector, something that's an important component. Um, so does it mean that we should allow, um, uh, you know, impacts to happen? Because that actually is, is the basis of the premise of the, of the vintage. You don't have to allow it. They will happen. I mean, uh, you have climate, uh, climate change there to do just that. And uh, uh, we are not lo losing the variability, quite the opposite. So the main impact we are feeling in the sector from climate change is an increase in variability uh, from year to year and uh, worse than, than everything else in the same year. We are seeing opposite extremes in the same year hitting uh, vineyards and, and grapevines and they actually cannot cope with that. So um, even though uh, there has been an enhancement in the quality of wines uh, in the last 30 years, mostly because of technology being involved, um, the increased variability from weather and from climate is actually uh, keeping it uh, harder as ever to produce top quality wine. Thanks. Okay, thank you. So um, I'd like to move on to a different topic now. We have a question on the chat. Uh, before we do that, I'd just like to uh, provide, to give a couple of plugs. One is uh, actually from Matt Gold. I know I, I'm not following that closely, but I know they are uh, running a summer school course of, along those lines. And this, this I'm sure will help to create a new uh, generation new experts also for this uh, uh, sector or this area of uh, translating the information from the users to producers and and so have a look at the Gold website and similarly on uh, Secretary Firm we are going to run uh, a summer school in September there's no information out there yet but we will uh, provide that very shortly it's a um, very interesting program that is being put together um, so the question that we have on the chat is for uh, Leah, the work and, and from, from Joe, the workflow for the South model seems quite complicated. 
who does the sometimes complex hydrology modeling and does the data go back and forth in this situation in such a workflow is such a workflow workable in real time um hi thanks joe um yeah it's it's not so complex really but yeah you do need um <clears throat> excuse me uh a researcher or at least somebody with uh, with knowledge of these models to set it up in the first place so to calibrate and validate the models um, but then once that's set up it can be automated um, so that's fine you can hand it over to other people if you want to then with caveats whether it's wise to do so we could discuss um, but the big bottleneck for running in real time that we found is just the downloading the operational seasonal climate forecast data from Copernicus, um, which could take like a few days. Um, so that's that's our bottleneck for sort of operationalizing these tools. Um, does that answer the question? Feel free to, we can chat more in, in the chat if you want. Okay, thank you, Leah. Yep, thank you. Good, um, I don't know if there are other questions. Any final comments? So if we can do a, a quick round, uh, 30 seconds each for each panel, just a summary of, of what uh, you've learned today or uh, your appeals about climate services, just in 30 seconds, some takeaway messages, and then we wrap up. Thank you. So we'll start from da -da -da -da, Leah. The short straw. Um, yeah, so, uh, well, some very interesting discussions just right here at the end um, from Antonio. I didn't get a chance to comment on that. I, I really like the, um, just the, the, the idea of a translator. And um, I feel in the WaterX project, um, we, the researchers who've walked in, worked in, uh, in sort of hydrology research, have, have acted as that translator. So we've, we've banged our head against all this, this language. Um, we worked closely with climatologists and with end users, and we were in the middle there. Uh, becoming educated and all of that and that was a really really interesting process um it would have been very useful for us to use the decision trees that steve uh, mentioned that's been really um, interesting to hear about that would have framed our our work from the start in a just a slightly more concrete way that's uh that was really nice to hear about um so take our messages from us then that great potential benefit for seasonal climate forecast to help in the water sector big challenges i see are um, the resources required to make these things useful um, at an individual site, as we've seen, are quite great. So how do you then make them um, useful outside research projects to the wider industry? Yeah, I think that's a big challenge. Thank you very much, Leah. And uh, next one, we go to Claire. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I, I, I was quite interested in, in, in Gertie's comment in the chat, actually, um, arguing more for sort of direct contact, direct connection between between the provider and the user. But Gertie, I mean, I think you yourself are probably a, 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 a translator as well, although maybe your foot is more in the in the provider camp. But, but I mean, I, I would would see you as a as a translator. But I, I mean, I think the other thing that's important is the is the kind of links back into the, the research and the model development community. So I think particularly in the context of seasonal forecasting, I think there's still quite a um, quite, quite a lot of science to be done. Um, a number of people have commented about the you know, relatively low skill in, in, in mid latitudes. So I think those of us who are sort of working in this interface area, we also have a responsibility to sort of feed back to the, to the international science community and the model developers. Thank you, Claire. Uh, can I can ask uh, now, Antonio, I mean, we've heard a lot from you, but uh, it'd be good to have uh, some synthesis. It's always good to hear your thoughts. Thank you. I just would uh, point out two things. One has got to do with um, uh, Herty's uh, presentation and the dashboard she has shown. I think the dashboard concept is becoming uh, a, an interesting proposition for interaction with users if they are developing users. It's something that should be more developed as a concept and even create some guidelines for standardization of, um, of, of dashboards in order that they can be understood easily by a wide public. 
Uh, the other proposition that I found very interesting is from Steve, um, the, the icebreaker decision tree and especially the bi-directional decision tree. I think that is a really powerful concept to get the conversation going and that can actually build, uh, build up trust between, between both sides. Um, as for the translator, uh, let me just tell you that one of the very good things we had in MedGold is that one of our uh, coordinator uh, climatologists, he's also a grape grower, and that facilitated the communication very much. Thanks. Okay, very, thank you very much, Antonio and uh, Steve. Uh, so the one thing which um is very much in my mind is the slide that Antonio sh showed, um, which I'm just gonna go back to and have it on my screen as, a, as I speak. Um, uh, Antonio, you had the lovely slide which showed the picture, a wine is climate data held together in pleasure and a climate service is climate data held together by wisdom. I, I thought that was really great. I've got a suggestion for a small edit, um, which is that perhaps we should say a good wine is climate data held together in pleasure, but it's under threat by climate variability. And a good climate service is climate data held together by wisdom. But of course, we can always make bad choices as we put the climate service together. So it's just a suggestion to add in the word good in each case. Excellent, thank you. We'll, we'll thank do you. it and quote yourself. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> Very good. And uh, last but not least, the Gerti, please. Okay, thank you, Alberto. Uh, a lot of things have already been said about the decision tree. I had difficulties with the binary, either number or words. I think both <laughs> have helped a lot. Uh, also the numbers, just put numbers on it, made it so much more um, easy to discuss with the end user and vice versa. <laughs> so, um, but it's like Antonio says, it helps to uh, convert the discussion a lot. Well, translator, mediator, yeah. I like to know and get into in, inside of what the end users needs are. And I want to mention that I'm a, I'm a farmer's daughter, so I, have, uh, I respect farmers a lot. And we have good Dutch wines now, thanks to climatology. So, um, but the word good is a difficult word. Um, if we have a good forecast of bad weather, people will not be as impressed as when we have a good forecast of good weather. <laughs> so I've found that something which is rather difficult. You, you can have, for instance, for December or January, uh, we had uh, quite good forecasts, but it was not of suitable weather. <laughs> it was of bad weather up to a part. Then there was a week of good weather. So the, the, the forecast was quite nice. But um, I want to thank, um, the EU and Alberta for the opportunities to have this fresh view of how to uh, use seasonal forecast, sub-seasonal forecast and climatology and, and change it into added value for the end user. So thank you very much for that and for the lovely day today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Gertie, and, and thank, thank you, everybody. We are five minutes over time, so I won't spend much time with my summary. I've uh, said before, I just want to put things into context and uh, uh, just to highlight the fact that we, we've moved quite a, quite a way from when we started the climate service journey. And uh, like uh, in the words of uh, Alessia, um, you know, we moved from the, the wheel to the, the, the wheelbarrow. So there's, uh, there's been quite a progression. And I always think in terms of what if, what if uh, you know, we didn't have this nine climate services under H twenty twenty? There, there's much more activity. There is uh, era four CS, is uh, C three S, and so on. So there's much more. So what if we didn't have all these climate services uh, happening? But um, for us, the secretary firm, the journey is not over. As I said before, so we still have a few months, and we'll show that we can go even farther and uh, we'll be happy to uh, have you also at our final meeting in October. We'll run a, a final kind of conference and we'll uh, showcase much more than what we've done. It'll be a longer event and, uh, and we'll be happy to share what, uh, what we found there. 
Um, so before we depart, I just want to thank um, all the people behind this, uh, the organization of this workshop. There are several and uh, they've done a, a, a great job so with, um, with Lucy, Leslie, Ella, uh, Janice, and uh, obviously the um, uh, contributions from other project partners. Uh, uh, everybody's contributed. Uh, uh, you'd like to know that when we organize uh, the, the, the events like this, we invite everybody in the project. We'd like to hear from everybody and then several people have contributed to that. So thank you everybody. And uh, of course, thank you to Gary for conducting us through all this uh, troubled waters. Not so troubled, but uh, it, it, it was a good word to put there. Um, and so thank you. Thank you again for the, the great uh, contributions and interaction today. We look forward to interacting with you further over the next several months. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>